A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Geber. Welcome, everyone. Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. And this episode has been generously sponsored by close members of the Breuer family in honor of the upcoming yard site of Rav Breuer, Lazecher Nishmas, Rav Breuer's daughter and son in law, Rabbi Eliezer Ben Rav Mordechai Mayer Silverman of Blessed Memory, and Mrs. Edith, Edith Silverman Bas, Rabbi Levi Yosef uh, Breuer of Blessed Memory, who just, she just passed away this, uh, this past year. And this uh, episode will be about uh, Rav Yosef, Rabbi Dr. Joseph uh, Breuer, the uh, founder and leader and rabbi of the uh, Kahala Dath Yishurun uh, community, the Kahila in Washington Heights, and about his life and a fascinating life. Before I get to that, um, it's a historical uh, event this week, the uh, death of uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. And um, his place in, in Jewish history is actually through his mother, his, uh, his mother, Princess Alice. Uh, you know, Prince uh, Philip was uh, born in Greece, and his mother stayed in Greece even after her separation from her husband and was there during the war. And she saved, at, at risk to her own life, she saved uh, Jewish lives during the Holocaust. She saved a Mrs. Rachel Cohn and her two children in Athens. She hid them while most Greek Jews were deported to Auschwitz, and she was recognized by Yad Vashem as a righteous among the nations. Uh, it's interesting that Prince Philip himself uh, attended the ceremony at Yad Vashem when his mother was uh, posthumously uh, honored. Uh, she's actually reburied in Israel in 1988. Uh, she's buried in Harazesim, of all places, in the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a very prominent landmark, which we always see when we pass on the way into Harazesim. Ironically, Another f- more famous uh, Righteous Among the Nations, Oscar Schindler, is buried in another non-Jewish cemetery right, right off of Harazesim as well. So you have all those uh, uh, in that area. Either way, um, we are having later this week and next week a on several-part mini-series on, on Toronto in our great uh, um, American Jewish, hist- Jewish cities history series. And... Canada is kind of American, and Toronto is kind of American. So that goes in, and it's very exciting. I'm probably going to do it in uh, three parts because there's so much Jewish history in in Toronto. So if you'd like to be involved in the sponsorship of that series, or if you have any uh, important anecdote that you feel we can't miss, so be in touch with me about that. When I was, there's actually a crisis going to go on later this week in certain Jewish communities in the in the world, because we have a very interesting situation this year. Um, Reb Shaila of Kerestir, uh, the is is his yard site on Gimel Eir, the same day as Rav Breuer, who we're going to be talking about. So uh, very, there are some communities that have the custom of not reciting Tachanun on the day of a great tzaddik's yard site. And what greater tzaddik can there be than Reb Shaila? So we don't recite Tachanun. On the other hand, the Israeli Independence Day, Yom Hatzma'ut, which is ostensibly on Hey Iyar, the fifth day of Iyar, is this year, it's, it's a muktam. It's being celebrated early because we don't want it to have it on a weekend, a runa weekend, God forbid. So it's going to be celebrated this Thursday on Gimel Iyar. And the, those very same communities that don't, that, uh, want to commemorate Rabshail's yard site, many of them 
also would like to uh, uh, point, you know, make a point of making uh, Yom Ma'ud, not, not not celebrating it at all. In fact, it's uh, somewhat a day of mourning in some communities. Uh, so we definitely would like to recite Tachanun on a day, on such a, a day like Yom Hat, the Israeli uh, Independence Day. So we have a very, very big crisis. I don't know how it's going to be resolved, honestly. So if anyone from our listeners wants to volunteer to go down to Williamsburg on Thursday and find out if the shuls there are saying Tachanun because it's Yom HaTzma'ut or they're not saying Tachanun because it's Rav Shail of, of Karistir's yard site, it would be good to know. But because the policy of Jewish history soundbites is to always stay neutral and not get involved in any politics or agendas, so we're going to go to a completely different topic. And as it happens, on Gimel Iyar is also the art side of Rav Breuer. And he's someone who is all beloved and accepted. So we're going to stay with that story. And uh, this way everyone will be happy. Now he is someone who lived for 98 years, nearly a century. He had a fascinating life and what he built and the amount that he accomplished. And uh, as a result, it's impossible to cover it all in, in one episode. So this story that, that I'm going to relate today is going to serve to express just as a few highlights uh, in this piece of uh, Jewish history, but not to be a comprehensive um, overview. Uh, the source that I use, and this is a uh, you know, one of those episodes where you only need one source. You know, there's nothing more that you need. Uh, amazing, amazing biography. Uh, it's. I would say that this is a cross between a profile and a book review because I'm uh, primarily using the biography of Rav Breuer, um, Rav Breuer, his life and legacy. Legacy, excuse me, by uh, Rav David Landesman uh, of blessed memory. And um, I think also Dr. Kranzler was involved, but um, it's it's one of the best um, profile biographies that's been written uh, in a long time. Uh, one of my favorite, and uh, very well written, very well researched, and source notes and, and and background and everything. I highly, highly recommend it. If you haven't read it, and if you don't own it, you should buy it, and you should uh, read it. They didn't even pay me to do this, and I'm just doing it for free because I like it so much. Um, and uh, and uh, I knew the author also, Dov has been a wonderful person, and he wrote very well. Uh, so um, so that's that's what I used basically f- to to prepare for this episode. But also I did get from several family members. I also like to thank several members of the Breuer family, especially from the Silverman uh, branch of the family, who graciously gave of their time to share some anecdotes and memories of their illustrious grandfather. And I will try to incorporate those stories as well. Um, Sir Rav Breuer is uh, one of my favorite uh, personalities of recent Jewish history, so it's exciting to be able to tell the story. He had a Hungarian background, interestingly enough, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, and of course he's part of the family of Rav Shamshin or Fall Hirsch, he's a grandson of Rav Hirsch, Rabiner Hirsch. He had a very long life and very big impact and influence, and I want to discuss the various uh, branches of that. He was both a Rosh Yeshiva in his early years in Frankfurt, and later, of course, he was a rabbi of the community. So it's two different facets of his life. He was also a leader who confronted all the major issues of the day. It's interesting. Another uh, very much a favorite book of mine is uh, it's called A Unique Perspective. It's a collection of his lectures and articles that he wrote between the years 1914 and 1973. It's like it covers all the major events of the 20th century. And this is someone who, like, very, un- I mean, the, the title of the book is unique. And I think it is unique because I, I can't think of another um, rabbinical leader who could directly confronted every single issue facing the Jewish people during such a tumultuous century and, and gave a very clear perspective and, and his, uh, in, in an unequivocal and fearless uh, way. Uh, so that's a collection of everything that he had to say, a very thick uh, book, also fantastic. So, so that's his leadership. Um, and there's different stages in his life. So I want to go and try to touch on uh, every one of those stages, if possible, as long as time permits. We'll start with his background, his family background, his father, his grandfather. Of course, his mother's father was, uh, his mother was uh, Sophie Hirsch Breuer. So his, um, his, he, um, he uh, grew up in, in the home uh, of of Reb Shamshin Rafal Hirsch, his, his children, I'm sorry, not Reb Shamshin Rafal Hirsch himself. He only met his grandfather once as a child. 
But uh, Rav Shalom Shavosh is someone who we still have to get to at one point. Um, when we'll have to have an episode or two or three or four about him. Um, so Rav Shalom Shavosh Hirsch became the rabbi of the separate uh, uh, community in Frankfurt, not the one that resigned from the mainstream community. That came much later. That came only after 1876. Uh, and he founds institutions, and he's a successful builder. He became the rabbi in Frankfurt in 1851, Rabshamshin Hirsch, and he creates this this community, this uh, this kehila, this separate kehila from the mainstream community, because he saw uh, uh, the value in Austrit. He saw his his philosophy in Torah im Derech Eretz, uh, um, which he wanted to uh, educate and inculcate his the members of his community. Now, around the same time that he became the rabbi in Frankfurt, um, his future son-in-law uh, is born in Hungary, Reb Solomon Breuer. And he studied at the Preshberg Yeshiva. He's a student of the Ksav Seifer, Reb Ram Shmuel Binyamin Seifer, the son of the Chassam Seifer. And he later on marries Reb Hirsch's daughter, Sophie. And close to two years after Reb Hirsch's passing, he's appointed the rabbi of the separatist community in Frankfurt. He had previously been the rabbi in Popa in Hungary. Um, this was not a Hasidic uh, community at the time, uh, and he was a he. Uh, it wasn't a simple transition uh, to Frankfurt. Uh, much of the community uh, was not so supportive. He almost left six years later to become the rabbi of the Shift Shul in Vienna, but he ended up staying, Reb Solomon Breuer, until his passing in 1926. Um, he was an Oberland Hungarian, uh, educated in Oberland Hungarian yeshivas, and uh, you know the match with uh, his father-in-law, who was uh, Yeki, and the Frankfurt Jewish community was a bit of a uh, transitional stage that until they learned to get along with each other. So it's interesting that uh, to, to point out that after following Rav Hirsch, who was obviously you know a, a German, a Yeki, he was from Hamburg, until. If we jump across the ocean to almost a century later, till Reb Shimon Schwab, when he became the rabbi in KJ, who was he himself was born in Frankfurt. So all the rabbis until between those two, between Reb Hirsch and Reb Shimon Schwab, all the rabbis in Frankfurt and in KJ Washington Heights were uh, from Oberland, were Hungarian from Oberland. It's a very interesting uh, historical uh, um, uh, tidbit. So, Reb Breuer himself, Reb Joseph Breuer himself, the subject of our uh, story today, he was somewhat of an exception because he was born in Popa in Hungary, born in Oberlan, but at age eight, he moved with his family to Frankfurt and he was educated in the Frankfurt institutions. So he's somewhat in between. Uh, either way, um, in 1882, Reb Breuer is born. He met his illustrious grandfather, of Hirsch, only once, uh, he remembered it for the rest of his life. It made a big impact on him, that uh, meeting. And uh, at eight years old, he moves to Frankfurt. He joins the schools there. He's one of the first students in his father's yeshiva. His father, Solomon Breuer, uh, opened the yeshiva in Frankfurt, which the Kehila was opposed to it because the Rav Hirsch did not open a yeshiva. So they refused to fund it. And they none of them sent their children to, to the yeshiva that he opened. The only ones who went to Rav Solomon Breuer's yeshiva in Frankfurt during the early years were his own sons, including Rav Joseph Breuer, and Hungarian students, people from Hungary, came to study in that yeshiva. Actually, one of the students in the, in the yeshiva from Hungary was the legendary historian, probably the greatest, I think that's undisputed, uh, Jewish, uh, maybe Salo Baron, but uh, the greatest, uh, uh, one of the greatest Jewish historians of the 20th century, Jacob Katz, um, was, was in yeshiva in Hungary, and he later uh, joined uh, Rav Breuer's uh, uh, yeshiva in Frankfurt, when Rav Solomon Breuer was, was, uh, was still alive, uh, because he wanted to go to university in Germany, so it was, uh, enabled him to do so. Um, uh, eventually, members of the Kehila uh, did send their children there, and eventually the Kehila got more involved in the yeshiva, and this was large, largely due to Rev. Joseph Breuer's efforts when he joined the faculty of, the, of his father's yeshiva later on. But he himself got smicha in Budapest from the legendary Rev. Kapel Reich, the rabbi, the rabbi of the separatist community in Budapest, who had actually been Rav Solomon Breuer's study partner in Pressburg many years before. And then later on, Rav, Rav Breuer got a doctorate uh, at the University of Strasbourg in 1905. And when he returns to Frankfurt, he becomes a teacher at the Hirsch Real School, the, what would be the elementary school. It was a, a co-ed elementary school, actually, um, the, in, the, in, the, in the community. Um, and he taught there. He taught literature. 
He taught history, so there you go, nice uh, connection to, to Jewish history, that Rav, Rav Breuer himself was a teacher of history. Um, so I definitely can't teach uh, Tyra like Rav Breuer did, but perhaps history, we have something in common. And he also taught Tanakh, and Tanakh would become uh, his lifelong passion, which we'll get to, we'll get back to shortly. Um, and uh, and then he, um, he, so he becomes a, teacher there. He also becomes a teacher in the yeshiva, um, in the, uh, a rebbe in the yeshiva, later becomes the Rosh Yeshiva of the Frankfurt Yeshiva. I want to digress for a minute because Rav Breuer in America was known as the rabbi, the leader, the head of the community, the head of the keil, the founder, the builder. And in the Frankfurt years, um, he was known as the Rosh Yeshiva. He was a teacher of Torah. In the, he, uh, I remember my uh, wife's grandfather, who was from Frankfurt, he said it was, it was an interesting transition for those who remembered him as a Rosh Hashiva to now see him as a rabbi, because he was so much identified as someone who was a Rosh Hashiva. Um, so he, he, uh, his, so Torah and learning and, and teaching was actually his lifelong passion. When he was semi-retired, he was never fully retired. He never fully retired until his passing at the age of 98. But he was semi-retired in his later years. He would spend most of the day studying himself with chavrusas, with his grandchildren. He was a tremendous Talmud Chacham. Um, in his later years, when he would, he, he would always vacation first in Hunter, uh, upstate New York, and later on in many years in Tannersville. So he would uh, have a daily study session with uh, uh, his, uh, his grandchildren. In fact, one of his grandchildren, Re- Reuben Silverman, related to me that he and his cousins had a daily Gemara Shir during the summers for 20 years uh, with their grandfather. Uh, Rev. Breuer's uh, true love in learning was Navi, and he authored and published works on Yirmiya, Yeshai, Cheskel. Uh, he would often uh, chide uh, the yeshiva students for their lack of knowledge in this, uh, what he considered a vital subject, and he made ne- their neglect in studying it. Uh, um, and uh, there was an ever-present, worn-out Tanakh on the desk in his office, which was put to constant use, and he had an absolute mastery of Tanakh. And when studying with Gemara with his grandchildren, and they'd encounter a pasuk in Nach in, on the Gemara page, so that was it. The shir in Gemara was over for that day. He would open his Tanakh and he would expound on the entire parak in Navi, which was relevant to that uh, that pasuk. With an excitement and enjoyment, you really saw how much he enjoyed the study of, of Navi. He knew actually every safer on his bookshelf. He had a very impressive library, uh, and the, he knew where each and every safer was. When he was elderly and he couldn't get up uh, constantly, and he also couldn't really see in his later years, he'd direct his grandchildren to which shelf and how many books to the right or left, and he was correct each time. He knew where every single uh, book was on his uh, shelf. So getting back to uh, Frankfurt, that just... Uh, Slight digression there. So in 1906, he becomes a Rebbe in the yeshiva. He gives a regular shir there. And his major innovation was an afternoon program which would pair up the yeshiva students with students at the real shul, at the elementary uh, uh, school, which led to many of the students in the real shul to instead of continuing on to gymnasium, to, to the German school afterwards, where they would actually take a year or two off before they would go to university, before they would go on to further their studies, they would go to study for full time in the yeshiva, which was a major innovation for the Frankfurt uh, Hersheyan Retirement Derech Eretz crowd, that they would go and devote a couple of years of their, of their educational life to studying Torah full-time in the yeshiva, and that was due to Rav Breuer's influence. So finally, the locals begin studying at the yeshiva. So if we think about it in a certain way, he implemented the first gap year in Jewish history. Now, the gap years and studying Torah in a yeshiva following high school before college is very common in many communities, and to come to Yisrael to yeshiva, even in those communities where Torah study is accepted as a given, but there's the idea of coming to study in Eretz Yisrael in the yeshiva, that idea of taking a year or two off and having intensive Torah study, as far as I know, the first one who uh, who implemented it in an actual curriculum, an actual program, was Rav Breuer. Um, in, back in Frankfurt in 1906, before he's famous, before he's even married. Um, so the, 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 yeshiva, the Frankfurt yeshiva was modeled actually on the Hungarian yeshiva, on Pressburg, to produce strong balabatim. It was not an analytical approach to study like in the Lithuanian yeshivas. It was more like Pressburg and other Hungarian yeshivas. Um, he was also the rabbi of a, of a uh, shul in Frankfurt, not the main shul. It was called the Klaus, um, and uh, he was a rabbi in the shul there. 
He, but he did not want to officially enter the the uh, the rabbinate. He did not take over his father when his passing. There was actually a very stormy and big dispute about who was going to take over of uh, Solomon Breuer following his passing in 1926, and it was somewhat of a, of a bitter dispute, which is not a story for now. That's when we cover a Frankfurt jury, which is another topic we have to cover at some point. Um, and the, I hope there's a lot of yekis listening, and they'll they'll volunteer to sponsor some uh, 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 some of these very important and vital uh, topics of of Frankfurt and Rav Hirsch and whatever else. Um, so uh, be in touch with me. And uh, he he, but Rav Breuer himself was he had, wasn't involved in the rabbinate. He limited involvement in Agudas Yisrael even. His father was the founder of Agudas Yisrael. His brother, Dr. Isaac Breuer, was the ideologue of Agudas Yisrael pre-war. And Rav Breuer himself kept to his yeshiva, to his students. He was not involved in communal issues at the time. In 1911, the Ridvaz, Rabbi Yaakov David Velofsky, who was then the rabbi in Sfas, um, was fundraising in Europe. And he made a shidduch between Rav Breuer and Rika Eisenman from Antwerp, who was one of those prominent families in Antwerp. Her grandfather was actually living in Frankfurt at the time. They got married. They built a large and impressive family. And uh, and he... he um, Continues on. The Nazis come to power. Hitler comes to power. Um, and Rav Breuer first accepts a rabbinate in Fiumi in Italy for several months with the intent of reestablishing his yeshiva there. When that didn't work out, he returns to Frankfurt, which is astounding. His brother, the famous Agudist Dr. Isaac Breuer, convinced him that the danger had passed. Uh, so he could return to Frankfurt. It was uh, not known what was going to develop with the Nazis in power during the 1930s. But as the 1930s progressed, um, they began to think of how to move the yeshiva on. He conferred smicha on several of his students at the yeshiva, so it would be easier for them to receive visas to be able to emigrate. Um, he traveled to England in 1936 to fundraise to be able to transport the yeshiva. And then he returns to Frankfurt with the money. Uh, which the Nazis eventually seized, unfortunately. He felt the total responsibility to his students in the yeshiva and, 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 uh, and to their welfare. The yeshiva somewhat lasted in, in a somewhat stable life until Kristallnacht. Uh, Kristallnacht changed everything for German Jewry in November of 1938, and the yeshiva was closed down. The shul burnt down. He was arrested, and the Nazis thought he looked older than 60. So they, during the lineup after his arrest, they said, everyone older than 60, step out of the line. And he was 56. And being honest, he did not step forward. Uh, so they, I'm sorry, he, he, they asked anyone under 60 to step forward. And since he was under 60, so he, he, was, he stepped forward. Uh, but uh, for some reason, the Nazi thought that he looked over the uh, uh, 60. So he pushed him back. And this spared him a concentration and very... Uh, uh, w- w- would have been a very unpleasant concentration camp experience, and uh, he was saved from that. So he goes back home, and uh, he, they decided it's definitely time to leave. Um, and um, after Kristallnacht was a watershed for a lot of German Jews, and he made it to Antwerp, where his wife's family was from, and then in February 1939, he makes it to the United States. His student, his former student, uh, Mr. Jacob Samuel, had got him the visa and arranged it, transportation, he got it through Dr. Revel of Yeshiva College, who provided the cover uh, for his visa that he's officially being invited uh, to Yeshiva College, which, which Dr. Revel did for many uh, great rabbis, uh, thus saving their lives. Um, so when Rev. Breuer and his wife, Rika, and a few of their children arrived in the United States, and Mr. Samuel found them an apartment in his building in Upper Manhattan, and he hosted them and took care of them in the initial stage. In fact, Mr. Samuel tried to explain to his American-born wife that Rev. Breuer would never eat in a home uh, of a woman who did not cover her hair. So she immediately went down to, to, to buy a shaitel. And she never removed it for the rest of her life. And she told that story to Rev. Breuer when he came to be, uh, to pay a condolence call upon her husband's passing in 1979, that uh, she, you know, covered her hair because of that awe that they had of Rev. Breuer and his, when he first arrived in the United States back then. So he decides he's going ahead and he's going to establish the Kehila, the community in in uh, in the United States. How did that come about? So the first job is he's there, so he's invited by several, uh, you know, many German Jewish refugees settled in Washington Heights. I discussed that in the episodes on uh, Washington Heights, and they invite him to become their rabbi. They had a Shabbos minion, and he decides he they invited him to become their rabbi. And so the second Shabbos that he's in America, he's their rabbi. And at the end of Shabbos, there's an announcement. They say that uh, their, their next Shabbos, this is the time of the davening. 
So he says, why not a weekday minion? Why is there no... Why is there no shul during the week? So he said, well, we have no room to have it. We rent this out only on Shabbos. We can't get it during the week. So he says, you know what? Davin in my home. He's moving up to Washington Heights. He moves up to Washington Heights. Davin in my home, you can use one of the rooms. And the children, his children had to wake up very early in the morning to enable for them to use the, his study, and his, which doubled as a bedroom, to, for the minion. And the weekday minion was hosted in his home because he felt that it should be a full, full minion. And he's going in full strength right away. It's interesting that uh, it wasn't his only job initially. He actually worked for Abshagah Feivel Mendelovich in a yeshiva that Abshagah Feivel established for refugee students in Williamsburg. And Reb Breuer taught there for a year. Uh, before it was too much for him, so he, he left, but he was very close with the Pachago Fievel, and um, they shared a lot of uh, similar world views in many ways. Um, you know, that uh, the um, Reb Reb Breuer is now becoming a rabbi. He was, he was the Rosh Hashiva in Frankfurt. Again, the rabbi of the community in Frankfurt was Reb Yosef Yenitz Viharowitz, and the rabbi of the main community, not the separatist community, was an, another fellow named Yaakov Hoffman, the non-separatist community, both of whom escaped and lived in New York. But uh, see, he was a natural Rosh Hashiva, a natural educator, and now he was becoming the rabbi of the Kila. He also met with Dr. Revel initially. To, to the, 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 Dr. Revel invited him to join Yeshiva College. That didn't work out. Um, so he's, he's building his own uh, institutions, his own Kehila. And he starts to build it together with his lieutenants, his, his people who who shared his vision and his goals, and they were able to help him with funding and organization. There was Dr. Rafal Muller, um, who, who, who ran the Kehila, who was the president for, for over close to 40 years, who passed, uh, passed away within a month of, of Rav Breuer's passing. So the two leaders of the community actually passed away pretty much the same time. There was Harry Levy and Manfred Katzenstein, who ran uh, the yeshiva and schools and the educational institutions. There was Israel Rothschild, who ran Kashrus. In other words, he had a cadre of, 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 of dedicated Balabatim who were with him, who shared his vision, and that's how the Kehila was able to be built. Now, the reasons for his success, he succeeded in building a Kehila. Now, the, the important term here, Kehila, is community. He's, he went out of his way to explain he's not making a minion, he's not making a shul, he's not making a yeshiva, and he's not making definitely not making a court, a Hasidic court. The idea was is that he's building an entire community with an institutional completeness, um, with Austrit, a separatist community that's not dependent on anyone or anything else, with the customs of Frankfurt. Uh, and the reason, why did he feel that he needs to have a community, a kehila, and not a shul? Because of Austrit, because of the idea that he can't, uh, that he can't rely on or recognize anyone who doesn't share his ideals, doesn't share the same dedication to halacha, to shulchan aruch, to Torah and mitzvahs, to the traditional Judaism and, and Jewish way of life that he and his forebears believed in. Um, and he wanted to continue the customs of Frankfurt. He wanted to engage also the individuals to build the community, to give them a sense of complete belonging to have full social services as well as religious and educational ones. And uh, institutional completeness and incomplete independence. He didn't build everything right away. It was obviously the financial constraints of what institutions he could build right away and what took time. Um, but the value system of Austria, of separation, of Tyrem Derech Eretz that he believed in, permeated all the institutions of the Kehillah, and he wanted it to be that way, and this way everyone would feel, feel the sense of belonging and commitment. Uh, the more that the individuals, like I mentioned some of the names before, but the more the individuals are engaged in building it, if it's a shul, you know, you could manage uh, just to come and daven in the shul. But if it's a myriad of institutions, and if it's an entire complete structure, an infrastructure of a community, then everyone is involved. Everyone is involved at some level, and everyone's committed to it and building to it, and therefore engaged in through their actions, and the values lying behind their actions become inculcated through osmosis, through, through, through the engagement. And that's what he really, really wanted to, to do and, uh, and to build. Um, now, the idea uh, that, that he wanted this kehila to be modeled on the one in Frankfurt. Uh, why was that so? Uh, and he, the, the idea was that, that it should be 
um, because the Frankfurt Kehillah and KAJ, Kehillah uh, Yishurin, was not a continuation of the pre-modern Kehillah, uh, which existed everywhere in Europe. In the pre-modern times, there was always Jewish communities. It was recognized by the government. A, the idea of the Frankfurt Kehillah was not a, just a continuation of tradition. It was a Hirschian Kehillah. It was a modern era, era answer to modern challenges uniquely suited to modern times. Very similar to its, to its, it, it, to its counterparts in Eastern Europe, like Hasidus was developed as an answer, like yeshivas in Lithuania were developed as an answer into modern times, to modern challenges. So too, Rav Breuer, as a continuation of Rav Hirsch, the modern Kehila model. This is something that I, the historian that I mentioned earlier, Jacob Katz, explained, that the Kehila system uh, is not just a continuation of something old, it's actually something completely new. It's orthodoxy's response built as a response, uh, which is a, a much bigger topic, which I can elaborate perhaps on uh, another time. He writes the bylaws of, of the community. It's very official, very formal. It was formally chartered and registered. He wanted to target the youth. He wanted English to be used. In fact, when he bring, he brought in Reb Shimon Schwab to be a second rabbi, uh, in addition to him in 1957, 1958, he wanted it also to be switched to English because uh, his, his English, his mastery of English was not as good as, as he wanted it to be. And Reb Shimon Schwab's was. And he felt that uh, the new generation should be hearing from their rabbi in their mother tongue, in English. Um, one of the institutions he builds, one of the first ones, and he put utmost importance, his priorities were not the shul, not the edifice of the shul. He had two other priorities before that, building the mikvah and building the school. And that's what he wanted to target right away. He wanted it to be, uh, it, to be uh, the, the current mikvahs that were in use were non-hygienic. And he felt, he, there's actually a story, uh, the Ger Rebbe, uh, the Mariamis in it mentioned to Reb Breuer's brother, Isaac Breuer, that the, the Garabah said that Polish Hasidic women were using their bathtubs for the mikveh and not a real mikveh because the mikvahs in Poland very often were not hygienic and, and not modern and not uh, not so clean, and they simply did not want to use the mikveh. Uh, so uh, so uh, he, Rev Breuer put this as a priority. He also heard that the Friedeke Rebbe, the previous Rebbe of Lubavitch, Rebbe Yitzchak Schneerson, had funds available for mikvah construction. So he traveled to Lakewood, where the Rebbe was staying at the time, and solicited funding from him. He didn't get much, but something. He encouraged the many, close to 30 other shuls in Washington Heights to join him in the mikvah project. And none of them did. So he painstakingly raised the funds and constructed it and everything on his own. In 1944, it was dedicated, and at that point, Many of the rabbis and the shuls who did not help him build it, they started to criticize it and question the kashras of it. And it's important to understand this background because to point this out, to understand that building his kehillah was never easy. There was always challenges. And yet he forged ahead undeterred by any of these, these uh, blocks that stayed in his way. Now another facet of his practical leadership in the construction of the mikvah was his understanding that, uh, that it had to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, had to be pretty, had to be attractive, had to be a, a nice building in interior. So he had women join the mikveh construction committee. Not only do did they did they understand aesthetics better than men, obviously that's my editorial. I don't think Rav Breuer said that, but they but they would what he did say was that they would be the ones using it, so they should have a say in the aesthetic side of of things. It's a, a, an illustration of his practical leadership. So he builds the school. And like they had in Frankfurt, he wanted the school to be uh, have religious teachers for the general subjects as well as the the uh, religious subjects. He built the shul in 1952. The shul was dedicated. They he there was a ladies uh, committee within the uh, ladies uh, 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 organization within the kahila. He felt that their their roles should be important as well. And then he decides that there's a, a kahila institution has to include kashra supervision, shchita. Chalav Yisrael, which was a big thing by him. Rabbi Alexander Rosenberg, the founder of OU Kashrus, actually assisted him in this endeavor. He found out that most of the shay- the wives of most of the of the shaykhtim in New York did not cover their hair, and he was horrified by that. So he decided he have to ha- he has to have his own shchita. The shaykhtim and the mashgichim were paid by the kehila, and he gave ashkacha to products and butchers and bakeries and caterers and restaurants and hotels because the kehila has to provide for all the services of its members, including leisure and vacation. 
uh, with the top Hechsher. Um He was threatened by the butchers and the Sheikhtim unions because he was independent. And he better than, uh, but and and he was better than anything else available and as far as kasha supervision. The only one who preceded him, especially with Chol Yisrael, was the Tzelem Aral. There was nothing else around at that time. Um, he was involved in machine matzo baking. Um, he worked with the and Steif and this and Kashrus and other 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 issues. Was actually, uh, uh, Wien, the Wiener Kehila Vienna was one of the only other uh, similar type of Kehilas at the time in New York, um, um, which you could even compare to to what Rav Breuer was doing. Um, in fact, there are st- still still several of what's called the Heimish uh, food brand uh, companies until today, which were started by members of Rav Breuer's community with his encouragement because he wanted more products to be available under the Hechsher of KAJ so that, that, the, that, that, that his community would have that availability, that kashrus availability. He demanded that any place that got the KAJ Hechsher, that it was not just for Yeridea, it was not just for kashrus, but it was also for kashrus in their monetary dealings, in Chayshin Mishpat. That's what the part of the Hechsher was for. So if you're if you're cooking the food right, then you can't cook the books e- that, that way either, so to speak. He set up again more kahila institutions. He established as a bezdin in the kahila and hires rabbis to be to sit on that bezdin for monetary law, for divorce law, for anything else. They uh, bought a plot for a cemetery in New Jersey in Clifton, and they make their own chaver kadisha. They did not rely on the New York citywide. Chavra Kadisha that everyone else did. They have their own Chavra Kadisha, voluntary. They open a girls' school, a girls' high school, a girls' seminary, a boys' yeshiva high school, a post-yeshiva high school, and even later a kail, which was a revolutionary concept in KAJ, which was influenced by Rav Schwab's input as well, but it was with Rav Breuer's approval. They had a free loan and chesed organizations, shiurim for adults and classes, newsletters, of the Kiel, the Mitlengun, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a publication society, and and he would constantly give his speeches espousing the values, the goals, the vision of, of what he wanted with this uh, uh, Kiel, and he would instill them with confidence that they could do it, that his, that his community can do it in a time in the 40s and 50s when, when, uh, when there was the distancing from orthodoxy, when there was this this, you know, you're really going against the current, really uh, building against the current, and and many things were not accepted, and many things that we take for granted today, he was a pioneer in building in his community. He was the first one to do it, and their community, the KJ, was the first ones to do it, and it was against the tide and against uh, and against the current, and he instilled his people with confidence: you can do it, making demands of them. And he spoke to his Kehila members openly. It was unlike any other congregational rabbi or Rosh Yeshiva at the time, the style that he would speak to his community members, that he would confront them with the challenges and speak to them and make demands of them and speak openly about the different things that he wanted them to improve on. Uh, and literally the Kehila that he was able to build is incomparable model to anything else that was being established in post-war America. There were shuls and yeshivas galore, but not Kehila. The other exception, like I mentioned, was Wien to a certain extent. There were some Hasidic rabbis or Hungarian rabbis. To a certain extent, that built something like a Kehila. The one that actually came closest, ironically, was probably the Satmarov. Um, the way he built Satmar was actually a Kehila. The major difference was that Rav Breuer's Kehila was built with the philosophy of Tairem Derech to be a part of society, whereas the Satmarov openly said, and most Hasidic rabbis at the time, that they want to build high walls and cut off as much as possible from society. So that's a major difference. Um, and here, in, in Rav Breyer's Kila, it was the Balabatim and the boards, uh, committees, all running it together, creating a very team-like atmosphere with personal responsibility. Everyone's engaged and involved, and therefore sharing the values. By the end of the first decade, by 1950, 10 years and what's going on in American Orthodoxy in 1950, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. There were over 800 members of his community, an amazing accomplishment. No one else grew that fast at the time. Uh, and he was a very strong and powerful leader of his community. He never went uh, beyond the community. He never went uh, you know, out into, he was never a, a conscious decision. He did not want to become a leader in Agudas Yisrael. He did not join Agudas Yisrael. He didn't travel. He didn't go to Israel. 
Um, he had he actually had an ambivalence, if not outright opposition to Zion, Zionism, like his father and Rav Hirsch, is because of Austrit, because of separation, and not uh, granting legitimacy to uh, Jewish communities that did not subscribe to the Shulchan Aruch. Um, so, uh, so that was, but his leadership of his community was total. It would, did not go beyond the confines of his community because he believed that each community should have its own leadership and with their own values and, and the, and the, and the, and the, but within his own community, he had a, 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 a very strong leadership. Now, it was with the two, the twin values of Austrit with Tyra M. Derecheretz. Uh, according to, to Rav Breuer, and its practical ramifications. If you take Austrit together with Tairam Derech Eretz, that's KAJ. If you have neither, ne- nor Austrit or Tairam Derech Eretz, that's Eastern European Jewry, Hasidic Jewry, Litvish Jewry. They, they didn't ha- believe in separation, and they did not believe in Tairam Derech Eretz. If you have Tairam Derech Eretz without Austrit, I'm not sure what that is, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we'll call that modern orthodoxy, for lack of a better term. And if you have Austrit without Tairam Derech Eretz, that's Yerushalmi. Uh, that's Yerushalmi Jews. Uh, Ruchaim Zanenfeld, in fact, said that Reb Solomon Breuer understood him and his situation better than anyone else in Eastern Europe because they shared the value of Austrit, of separation. And while the Gerer Rebbe in 1924 tried to make a, a brook a compromise between Rav Cook and Rav Zonenfeld, and the dispute at the time was essentially about Austrit, about, ex, about separating from the Knesset Yisrael, which the British mandate in Palestine recognized as the Jewish community of Shalayim, but resigning from the community. That was the dispute. Um, the, 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 the Lithuanian approach versus the Hungarian approach of separating from the community, of resigning from the community. It was not really that much about Zionism, uh, as, as is incorrectly understood today. Uh, that's, not, that's also for another time. Uh, but Solomon Breuer dispatched his son Isaac to give legal assistance to the Eid Haredes, representing them to the British. So the Gareb is trying to make a compromise because he comes from Poland. Whereas, uh, whereas the Breuers, who understood Austrit and they identified with what Reb Chaim Zanifel was trying to do, they were the ones who backed him up. Um, so it's important to understand the, the underlying issue at this stage was not about, was less about Zionism as it's, uh, it was more about Austrit. In this context, it's also worth pointing out that Austrit was of such paramount importance to both Reb Solomon Breuer and later his son Reb Joseph Breuer, that if one studies his actions and the building of the Kehillah post-war, one can discern that Austrit and its principles were pretty much the guiding light of the entire project. And one can argue that it was the measure of his success as well. Uh, Breuer strongly believed in the approach of Tyrem Derech Haritz, believing as his father and Hirsch did that it was the ultimate approach and not a Hira Astro, it was not a temporary solution, and it was not Bidievit, this is the ideal approach, and it was not something to apologize about. He spent a good deal of his life and energy clarifying his position on Tyrem Derech Haritz and fending off criticism on both the right and the left. In fact, my great uncle, my wife's great uncle told me that Rav Breuer told him in one of his last years that we need to change the language of the Ksuba because the girls now support their husbands and Kyle. And, uh, and we have to, we have to change around what the Ksuba was. And he was saying that in a, you know, in a wry or, or a sarcastic uh, way. Uh, he was very confident in the way of Tarim Derecharetz. And he said that the last words he heard from his father was, quote, I am fully convinced that Rav Hirsch's way will be Makar of the Geula. End quote. And he really lived by that. Um, in his later years, he had very physical limitations. Um, Reb Shimon Schwab was enjoined the rabbinate in the Kehila. Um, and, uh, in his later years, he would spend longer summers in, in, uh, in, uh, in Tannersville, upstate. And he, um, and he spent a lot of time with his family. And, uh, the Breuer family, it was, uh, it gave me several, several anecdotes, several stories about his time there. Um, it was very interesting. I want to share a few of those stories. The, um, the, uh, uh, he was on vacation then. He was not the Rav of the Shul in Tannersville. So it was an opportunity for his family to spend special time with him in a more relaxed atmosphere, especially the ones who didn't live in Washington Heights during the year. And this is where Breuer was generally relaxed. He was able to interact differently with his family, with his grandchildren. It was outside the Kila, outside the city. Um, and on Moitzi Shabbos, uh, Rav Breuer would bless each child, child-in-law and grandchildren in age order from oldest to youngest after Havdalah. Um, this was, there were tens of people there, and he would give them a, a blessing. The youngest grandchild was the one who was last every week, because it was an age order. So every time he came to make him feel better that he was the last, he would say, Achrin, Achrin, Chavav, the last is the best, and you get special attention. 
Um, Reb Re- Breuer would distribute expensive cigars to selected children and grandchildren each made to Shabbos. As, as most Yaquis, Reb Breuer was uh, a big uh, cigar smoker. He enjoyed good cigars. Through his late 90s, he still smoked cigars in his office. It's fascinating. Um, well, following the bar mitzvah of this youngest grandchild, he joined the elite club of the ones who got cigars from Reb Breuer on Maitzi Shabbos. So this 13-year-old boy received a weekly cigar. Uh, Rev. Breuer's daughter, uh, Edith, married an outsider, married a non yeki Rev. Alta Silverman, a Litvak who studied in Slobodka by Rav Matcha Epstein. And these children, these Silvermans, grew up in other parts of the city where he was rabbi, and uh, in a different type of culture, in a different type of environment. They were, grew up in a uh, Litvisha home. So they got close to Rev. Breuer in Tannersville, where they got to study with him and spend time with him. Um, Rav Alta Silverman uh, passed away in 1972, so he predeceased his father-in-law. So since his grandchildren were now orphans, Rav Breuer paid special attention to them, and the cigar treatment is perhaps uh, one expression of this. This grandson, uh, Mark Silverman, who told me the story, also related that he would accompany him daily on his daily walks to shul for several years during the summers in Tanner's Reform and Chamayrev. And Rav Breuer walked very slowly, so it took about 40 minutes to walk to shul. Uh, and he couldn't see well either, so you'd ask him to tell him where the puddles are so he could avoid them, so he shouldn't get his shoes dirty in the puddles. And this is, this is how he walked always in his, until, his, till his, till his, uh, till his dying day. He'd also lean on his arm and comment on how athletic his grandchild was. He would even ask him about color war in camp. He would comment and, and give thoughts on the theme song in color war, on the banner, on the Divrei Torah, on the marching songs. So he really engaged his American grandchildren. He took care of him when he was sick during the summer, and since he was a young orphan, he, he, uh, he made a bar mitzvah for him in Tannersville a few weeks after his father had passed away. Um, uh, very, you know, the, the touching uh, grandfatherly relationship here. This, this Rebbe Lezer Alto Silverman, this uh, son-in-law of Rev Breuer, had a unique and wonderful relationship with his father-in-law. He was the only one in the family who came from a different world than his father-in-law. Had, like I said, Smicha for Ramayi Shematcha Epstein in Slobotka. And he served in the rabbinate and in educational positions in New York. And uh, their wedding took place in 1945 in the Breuer Kehila, when he married Rav Breuer's daughter. And Rav Breuer was the Masada Kedushin, even though Rabbi Silverman's father was Rav Mordechai Meir Silverman, who was an elderly Litvisher Rav. But he insisted that Rav Breuer be Masada Kedushin because he conduct the ceremony, because he's the Mara the Asra, it's his Kehila. Uh, so Rav Silverman, uh, this Rav Alta Silverman picked up German on his own, and he would converse regularly with Rav Breuer on a myriad of issues and Torah topics, especially during these uh, summers in in uh, Tannersville. The people think that Rav Breuer was very Germanic, austere, and serious, but he actually had a great sense of humor, and he had a great laugh. Uh, Shabbos afternoon, one grandchild recalled that he went to the t- he was speaking to his grandfather about how he had recently attended the Tish of the Baba Rebbe in Barra Park. And it was the first time he had gone to a Tish. The Rav Breuer was very interested. He wanted to hear all the details of the Tish. And his grandson said, I got a piece of apple as Shariam. A few minutes later, Rav Breuer's daughter, Mrs. Meta Bechafer, who's actually still alive, um, may she live and be well, she brought in a plate of grapes and Rav Breuer proffered some grapes to his grandson. So his grandson declined. So her brother said, Oh, when the Baba the Rebbe offered you Shirayim, you accepted. But when I offer you Shirayim, it's not the same. So that's, uh, that's how he joked to his, his grandchild. His grandchildren picked up a bit of German and would try to communicate with him in a mixed uh, German and English. Some of them would actually uh, take German as a language in school. Uh, to be able to communicate with him. Rav Breuer passed away at the ripe old age of 98 in 1980 with a large funeral. It was kind of an end of an era. I once interviewed, actually, a few middle-aged uh, yakis who grew up in the Washington Heights and then later on became more yeshivish. They attended yeshiva schools and it was a curious phenomenon that their lifestyle became a bit distant from the uh, value system of the, of the uh, yaki kehila. So I was, I was curious about it, so I interviewed a few of them, and I asked one of them when was the last time he was in Washington Heights, in the Kehila Shul, and he told me I was there for a Breuer's Leviah. That was the end of an era. And it was, it's a, somewhat of the end of an era. It's interesting to mention that his room has remained virtually untouched since his passing in 1980. If you go into the uh, old apartment, it's like being transported uh, back in time. So even though we went about uh, 20 minutes longer than we usually do, or 15 minutes longer, but this was very interesting, uh, the story of Rav Breuer. So this is uh, Yehuda Gabriel with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGabriel.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, uh, sponsorships, lectures, 
And you can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter at JSoundbites, and I hope you enjoyed.